history of Kerman. So could you please let us know how you got to Kerman and how everything got started? Okay. The reason I came to Kerman was that I wanted to find some place that was close to a college that my children could live at home and drive to school. So I had looked all over the state for a place and I found this one. And it was close enough that they could drive to school and work in the store afterwards. And I used the, if they didn't do their homework, they had to work in the store. So if they did their homework, well then they could move off. Is this the only place you've lived in Kerman, or were you moving around? No, no. Uh, we moved to Kerman on March the 10th, and that was at 2590 North Madeira Avenue, the grocery store right across from Old Kerman High School. And your children attended the Old Kerman High School? What? All of your children attended the Old Kerman High School? Well, oh, yes. And then how did you end up owning this part of town? <clears throat> how did I end up owning this part of town? Well, the community bank was right over here on the corner, you know, where the bank used to be and there's no bank there anymore. Uh, I had gone to the bank and I was walking out of the bank and but Douglas was manager of the bank, um, president of it. And he says, Joe, why don't you buy this piece of property across the street from the bank, which is just north of Stanislaus, and put it in a mobile home park. So I stopped and I turned around and I says, well, bud, if you will loan me the money to build a park, I'll do that. So the main office of the bank was in Bakersfield. So he called Bakersfield and asked him if they would loan the money. And they said yes. Well, he Told me yes, they would loan the money. I just stopped and waited. He made the phone call, and uh, and I was parked out in front of the bank, so I didn't come on down to the street to make the, the intersection to make the U-turn. I just made the U-turn right there to the street because the gentleman was sitting out in the yard at the time, and I. Ask him if he wanted to sell that. And he, yes, sell it. He had tried to do that and get his kids to run it, but they didn't want. The kids couldn't get along together to run it. So he, uh, they didn't want it. So uh, this was about just before the bank closed. I think they closed at 3.30 in the afternoon, back in that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, at 10 o'clock the next morning, I put that piece of property in escrow. And I paid him fifty thousand dollars for the whole block over there. I mean, all of that mobile home part of the property cost me fifty bucks. Put in the mobile home park. Well, Mr. Lazarus has mobile homes, Kerman mobile homes for sale over there, and he would put in one or two mobile homes of the space 
and then the people could, they'd be all set up. When the day it cleared escrow, they could move in. Right then. We got it going, obviously. Then it was paying each of us approximately $7,500 a month. So we did not take any money off of it at all. We paid all that down and paid it off. Paid it off in three years. Well, they made pretty good money for it. That's how I entered into buying this place because now I've got a surplus of money and they wanted 150000 for this. From Stanislaus to Sunset, from Madera Avenue to 6th Street. That's the walk. So I paid $150,000 for it. Well, before I just got it out of escrow and Federal Land Bank bought the corner here where the insurance office is built. Mm -hmm. And they paid me a hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars for that corner. So they paid off the almost the whole block. Huh? It paid off almost the whole block that you had paid for. Well, with with that, and at that time I had enough money, so I just paid it off, cleared it off. So these apartments are they yours? What? These apartments are they yours? They are not now, but I sell them. Like I said, when I moved here, this was cotton land. And I got cotton a lot of to prove that. <laughs> and I was doing business with a couple sawmills up in the state of Oregon, Eugene, Oregon. So, I got this all settled and I got a, a bid on this and so then I bought all the lumber up there and I had two trucks so I hauled all the lumber down here and we built them. I decided that we would build our own bank. So from the time I left Bakersfield until I drove home, I had a phone in my pickup and I called different people around. And I raised five million or promises of five million dollars to start a new bank. That's how Kerman State Bank got started. Who were the guys in that were you involved with you in setting up Kerman State Bank? Huh? Who were the guys that were involved with you in setting up Kerman State Bank? Okay, there was uh, Rainbow LaFranco. Rainer's place down here. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's the guy's name over in the bio that's. Sean? Sure. No. Sakata. So, Sam Sakata. Uh, Jerry Henry, the attorney. Uh, what was the Russian guy? Hop. Huh? Hop? Pete Hop was one and there's another one. Russian guy. Um, that's how all of that got started. As we can see by the blanket, you were, you served in the Marine Corps. Could you please tell us a little bit about that? 
What? About your service. Could you please tell us a little bit about it? Type, Saipan. Oh, Saipan? Okay. I went into the Marine Corps. And we made five operations. We went directly from the States to Roy and Namur. We could not, I was in the artillery, and we couldn't even take our guns ashore because the islands were so small, we couldn't back up far enough to get them to land on the island. So they had to do the shelling from ship. <clears throat> but and that didn't take very long. We take that in about uh, two weeks, I think. We had it all, and uh, we did take our trucks ashore because that was the only transportation that we had. Well, I was in K Battery, Fourth Battalion, Fourteenth Marines. Well, it was. We had the uh, 23rd Regiment, Regiment Infantry, 24th and 25th machine, uh, four, one, five, one, oh, five houses at that time. So each house group would furnish the Regiment of Infantry transportation. Well, the Infantry uh, regiment that I was trans transportation to. I hold all, all the ammo and you know unload ship. They bring it over and put it on my truck, and I go around and distribute it. We. I was distributing and we had a lieutenant, nice guy, but he wasn't as intelligent as <laughs> he should have been. Mm -hmm. uh, they gave me directions how to go up there, but he went with me and he changed it. Well, that put us between, this is our people here, and this is the Japanese here, and we're out here in the middle. My personal, I had 27 guards on the truck, and my personal bodyguard was set and safe by me. His name was Fred Hicks. And we're driving down through there, and man, I mean, bullets are coming in there, going over the front of the truck, and fortunately they were duds, and didn't explode. But his buddy that he went to high school with said, Fred, you guys better get out of there. If they don't kill you, we will. So at that point, I turned to that lieutenant and I told him, I said, sir, you are no longer in charge. And I was a PVT. Mm -hmm. You can see it right on the end of the bike of this PFC. Mm -hmm. Now, I said, if you want to get out of here, you get, you hop on and I'll take you out. But don't open your mouth or you're dead. Drove him down to the headquarters. Wait a minute. When you took off, what did you hit? Huh? What did you hit? Stopped you dead in the water oh. out in the middle between the lines. 
Well, I, I had to stop. <laughs> where the planes had blown up. I had delivered ammo between the front lines because the planes had flew over and bombed out a little crater. Crater for me. And that's where and they wanted me to hand unload the the ammo, which I had flamethrower flooded on, had machine gun and all that kind of ammo on the truck. And I said, okay, get out of here and leave me alone. The truck was a dump truck. So I put it in the air to dump it. Went back and left tailgate down. And the other son had come running over, no, 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 no. I said, get the hell out of here before I blow you up. <laughs> and uh, so he did. And I dumped it all in the crater. Didn't lose anything. Off, guys. <laughs> That's when we take taken off and Fred's guy told us, we better get out from between the front lines that if they didn't shoot us, they would. Right. <laughs> so we found a guy that was out wandering around. He, he didn't know whether he was coming or going because he was shell-shocked. So I picked him up. And I put him in the back of the truck, and he was going to do this, and he was going to do that. So I just called a couple of my guards to come. So I put him in the back of the truck and sat on him, and <laughs> I drove down to. You hit the stump. Huh? And that's you when hit I hit the stump. And I drove down. Then after, and I didn't back up when I uh, hit the stump. But kill the engine. I what did, did you kill the engine, and my starter was not working. The solenoid oh, yeah. underneath the truck was out, and I didn't have a spear. So I had to jump out of the truck, crawl under the truck, and I had a battery cable so long, and I had a kind of a U made out of it, and I strike both. Jumped the uh, connection on each side of the sunlight. And I started the truck, and when I got back in that truck, that engine went way up, and I just jumped that stump. And I got out and I drove down to the headquarters. And Captain Smith at that time. He came on and he said, what's wrong, Joe? And I said, well, uh, I am not refusing you to go back to the front lines, but if you send Lieutenant Jenkins with me, uh, he will not be alive when we get back. Because I said he's been done. And so Jen, uh, this uh, Lieutenant Jenkins, he was, he didn't like that to do that. And he was walking around, and the captain says, Is that true? Lieutenant Jenkins and I said, Lieutenant, you better be honest with him and tell him the truth. Because if you don't, you're dead now. And he said, Yes, it is. Tell the truth. Well, he said, That's okay. You can work on the detail loading the truck. 
So he got to load the truck. Busted him to private. Huh? Busted him to private. Yeah. <laughs> right then and then. The reason all of this was huh? so critical is when he hit the stump, they were under fire from a machine gun. Fifty years later, at a reunion, I met the guys that were in the back of the truck, and they said that the machine gun bullets were hitting inside the dump truck and just bouncing around, and they were sure they were gone. And they didn't know who the driver was. So when I told them, well, he, oh, they were all real excited because he had actually crawled out under the machine gun fire, crawled underneath the trunk, jumped the starter, and got them going again. And you, you, you left out the part where there was you were being fired on. <laughs> 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 kind of important. <laughs> yeah. See, there's a, yeah see, there's a, he earned the Bronze Star for that. I was wondering if there was an award. So we got all that done. How about uh, the supply dump and who would feed you or wouldn't feed you and where oh, you got your food? Yeah. Uh, on Raw in the Moor, uh, I backed up to the supply dump because the, lieutenant, the major would not you let us show to the challenge. Because we did not belong to his outfit. It was a Navy chow line and you were Marines. Yeah. So, Colonel Behaven, he walked up to me and he said, You got any complaints, John? I said, Yes. The major there won't let us go. So he unbuttons his coat, and jacket, taking it off. He says, give me your jacket. He put his jacket on. He walks up. He says, get in line. So I got in line. He got in line behind me. And we got up there and the major says, you can't go in. Well, the colonel said, yes, he can. And within a half hour, the guy had been busted from major to PBC, and they transferred him into motor transport and he was uh, kind of like a handyman, you know, you want something done to your truck, you say, I wash my truck. <laughs> he had to wash our truck. Well, we punished him that way. Speaking of having fun, uh, speaking of having fun, going back to Maui where you were uh, training and the gunnery sergeant wanted to everybody to get on site, set up their guns, and be camouflaged. And the first one that did it uh, oh. got uh, furlough. Yeah. That. Yeah. Uh, we were in, we were practicing, and we set up, set up, and the first one that would get to get in, unhook their gun, unload their ammunition, and get that all squared away, and go park. First one in the parking lot, you know. And, 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 and when I say parking lot, you found a tree that you could get under so that you didn't have to camouflage your truck. And I did. And, and I was first one out. But they had governors on those trucks. Well, I backed mine off. 
my governor off. It had a seal. Uh -huh. It had a lead yeah. seal. And you, that's what you're saying, backing off. You yeah. worked the wire out of the lead seal. But I got it fixed to where I could back it off. And uh, I got it backed off. Well, my truck would go about twice as fast as anybody else's truck. And uh, they decided they better check my uh, governor. Well, as soon as I got it over in the parking lot, obviously there was a good tree there and I could I pulled my truck under it. The first thing I did was raise the hood and ran it back up. 21 notches. They came over and uh, watch your keys. I gave them to them. They taken it out and they tested the truck. Okay. It was running where it was supposed to. Because I set the governor back. So we had a lot of fun at that. You can have fun if you want to, or you can be miserable if you want to. And I chose to have fun. Mentioned that before, you had mentioned that before these apartments were built, there was cotton. How was the rest of Kermit? How was the rest of coming? Well, there wasn't very much of it here. There was uh, Bank of America mm -hmm. and all those down there around <coughs> Reno's place. And this was all vacant out here. Mm -hmm. So seeing how Kerman has changed to now, do you prefer prefer it how it was back then or how it is now? Well, you have to find out the reason. I would prefer, if I was starting over again, mm -hmm. I would prefer that it was back like it was then. You say, well, why? It's grown. It has a lot of development in here. Well, if you go to a town that's fully developed, where's your opportunity to make money? Mm -hmm. You want a place that can be developed. So that you come in and you develop the town and you make money. Now, Joe Boyd was the only person that had guts enough to build houses here at that time. Mac Lazarus and I, we were the only. And I guess maybe Mac wasn't so dumb as I was because I wasn't selling mobile homes. But this guy wanted, and Bud Douglas, the banker, wanted to build a park there. And I was just dumb enough to go along with it. So Mac couldn't buy it because the guy wanted too much money, but I was poor, and the guy allowed me to buy it for fifty thousand bucks, the entire ground for the mobile park. And Mac helped you put it together by encouraging people to uh, yeah locate their mobile homes there. He'd well, what he would deal. do is he would set mobile homes up in there, 
totally set them up, you could move in. So he sold you to move home and he cleared us for at noon today. By nightfall, you can be moved in your move home. And at that time, we controlled, Mac and I did, 8% of the total housing, counting the, each space as a house. You know, you had to put your more home in there. But just counting that as your house. 8%. And this came directly from Kerman. Kerman High School. Mm -hmm. We had eight percent of the total uh, housing at the Kerman Unified School District. And Mr. Boyd was building houses all around, all the time. And Herman just kind of gradually grew right out and... It is what it is now. Mm-hmm. How would you describe the town of Kerman? How would I describe it? Mm -hmm. What type of town? Well, now I'm going to tell you a story about that. That probably there's not a single person in here that would believe it, and I don't really care because <laughs> it's true. <laughs> My son, there, we were delivering paper trays. We had 21 trucks in and a car, and the railroad was going on strike. But I'd pull off the whole train up at Portland, Oregon, and transfer everything from the train to the trucks. And, I, and all, of, all 21 of those trucks, or 22 of them, got here at the same time. We had all of The high school's grounds covered with trucks out there. We had up and down the highway covered with trucks, and our little yard was covered with trucks. We had a highway patrol car sitting at Clinton and a highway patrol car sitting at Shield controlling the traffic through there. Or that because uh, bunch of traffic and my wife said on the phone and we had three lines coming into our phone and she never said hello well the phone was ringing because all these farmers were afraid we are not going to get our paper tray the railroad's going on a strike at midnight tonight and she just sat there on the phone and she went down. One, two, three lines, one, two, three. It just started all over again. And it was ringing that fast. And she says, your paper trays are here, come get them. Your paper trays are here, come get them. Your paper trays are here, come get them. And we did not handle not even one bundle off of those 27 trucks. The farmers all came, they loaded each other and got out of here. The highway patrol kept track of the traffic and they worked with us and they'd let the trucks or pickups and whatever get back on the road and get out. So we had both ends blocked. Everybody was helping everybody else. Yeah, everybody was helping. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I told you he loaded up and then delivered 500 bundles of paper trays and did not write an invoice. <laughs> I screwed up. He couldn't let you go with that. Yeah. And, uh, 500 bundles. So Vic and Vic Howard, Vic was the first person that came in and says, Joe, so Savinko so is looking for the invoice. For third trace, you can't find it. Vic, I didn't write you one. How many did you get? He told me. I wrote him an invoice for it. Came it home, wrote me a check back. And he told everybody in the community, because he knew everybody in the community that didn't have them. And I am very proud to be able to say I did not lose not even one lousy bundle of paper trays. They all came in and paid me. So every one of those people were very honest and they paid for it. This community has been extremely good to me. <laughs>